Hey guys, welcome back to the What Comes to Mind series. Today we are on episode 25, talking about viruses that can actually help us and not harm us. And believe me, it's quite interesting. Now, in the previous episode, I talked about COVID-19, a virus that's really harmful that we know around the world at the moment. It's a pandemic that's caused all sorts of devastation to various facets of how we live. And we know other viruses that are harmful and that are a detriment to our body. Influenza, HIV, herpes, you know, common colds, the rhinoviruses. All of these are viruses that cause some sort of problem to us. But there's actually a group of viruses that are actually really, really beneficial for us. And it's a type of therapy that's gaining more attention for reasons that I'll discuss towards the end of today's video. So this group of viruses that I'll be talking about today can and have been very used in genetic research. But more famously and more importantly, it's being used at the moment and more researched in combating actual infections that antibiotics can't deal with. And as we know now, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem. And these type of viruses are quite crucial for that purpose. So what are these actual viruses? I've held you long enough. I shall now reveal what is the name and what actually are they? They are known as bacteriophage. Bacteriophage meaning, so the phage bit of that word is derived from a Greek word known as phagin, which means to devour. So these viruses actually devour bacteria. They only infect bacterial tissue. They replicate inside, then they destroy or, you know, eradicate that particular bacterial cell that they're in. But they don't infect animal tissue. But more importantly, they don't infect human tissue. So start to figure out why this is actually more of a beneficial virus. So as I just alluded to, the reason why it is different to the other viruses I mentioned at the start of the video, those that are pathogenic, so those that are harmful to our bodies, is that it only infects certain bacteria that you can design it for. It doesn't actually infect host cells, in particular animals or humans. And the reason why I really emphasize that is when you see throughout this video, how important that particular concept is of only infecting bacteria, not human cells become. And hopefully it can shed light the more I talk about this particular topic. Bacteriophage. Quite interesting. So where was it discovered? Where did it actually originate from? Who discovered it? And how do we know so much about it now? Let's take a little mini history lesson. Back in the earliest 20th century in 1915, Englishman scientist named as Frederick Tort actually started to understand and uncover this notion of viruses that harm bacteria. Two years later, um, a French Canadian scientist named as Felix de Herrer, hopefully I pronounced his name right, also then started to find something quite interesting related to this notion of viruses or again the term phage that can only infect bacteria what that actually started to find was a lot of these phages were discovered near many forms of bacteria so in sewage in actual pipes in stool samples from patients they started to uncover that these phages or these viruses were located anywhere near a bacteria source so obviously that was quite important. Why does that actually happen? A few years later, a Georgian scientist known as George Elevar actually started to uncover similar results and went to the Pasteur Institute in Paris and met the French Canadian scientist Felix de Herrer. And in 1923, he actually f started his own institute, the Olivier Institute, that focused purely on fog research. And remember, this is back in 1923, nearly a century ago. That's where this term phage therapy actually started. Now this concept was starting to become more concrete and more experiments were being produced and discovered by these scientists and many others around the world on this notion of, okay, how can we produce a cocktail and culture these viruses to target a particular bacteria that we want that are harmful? However, around about 1940s, when this started to become a little bit more mainstream, at the same time, the notion of antibiotics was also being researched. We know the famous story about Alexander Fleming. I actually did a historical episode, which you can see here, about the origins of penicillin. And around about 1940s, antibiotics were, were gaining a lot of attention. And before about 1942, antibiotics, in particular penicillin, um, because that was the first one that was discovered and purified and tested, were used in the World War to treat infections in soldiers. And because of that success rate, by the time it was 1944, antibiotics, um, in particular penicillin, were being manufactured in large scales. And because of its ease of synthesis compared to culturing viruses, it got a lot of attention, and rightly so. And unfortunately, the interest in phages started to die away because of the emergence and the success of penicillin. Or back then, it was actually known as Oxford. 
happened instead. But Forest Therapy wasn't going to go down without a fight because as we know now and even through the last part of the 20th century, the term antibiotic resistance started to come about and the notion and the renewed interest on Forest Therapy came back because once antibiotics was heavily utilised and even now we started to realise there's a lot more infections occurring that antibiotics can't treat so we need actually another solution. That's where Forest Therapy became incredibly useful. So the question arises, why is it not mainstream? Why is it not widely utilized? The question is that these are live viruses that you culture to combat a particular strain of a bacteria. So they can be cultured in petri dishes or these little, you can say, dishes you find in laboratories. They grow and then you then formulate them into a little cocktail that you then administer to a patient who may or may not have a particular type of bacterial infection that these specific viruses combat. It's not as easy as generating a chemical drug that you make, i.e. antibiotic, um, and then you can administer it to a patient. It's a little bit more invasive, a little bit more extensive, and it's not as straightforward. That's not one of the reasons. But I don't want today's video to be about how this forest therapy is delivered. I want it to be focused on the general benefits and limitations it has in general. So to start off with the benefits is when this is used, when it works, it really works. To put this actually into perspective, uh, last year in 2019 in Brownsville in New York, a person had a long standing infection in his knee that potentially required amputation. They used forest therapy to successfully treat the infection and actually prevent the person getting the amputation. Now, if you think as a, a last resort end stage infection, it must have been so severe clearly to potentially have an amputation. But a virus treated and combated and eradicated that bacteria to prevent the person actually having. An amputation and that's some of the you know the future directions that this potential therapy could go it has the power and the potency to prevent somebody having an amputation based on completely eradicating an infection that must have been quite tricky to even combat through current antibiotics to give another example uh, in 2017 a woman had a antibiotic resistant infection and also suffered from cystic fibrosis a quite genetically inherited condition that's quite detrimental. Coupled with the antibiotic resistant infection, that's not an easy place to be. But they successfully used forest therapy to treat that type of antibiotic resistant infection that could have lead to serious complications if it wasn't treated for that particular patient. So it gives you the idea of the power this therapy has, even though it's actually a virus. I just want to stop and show you something. Then it look really cool. All right, let's carry on. Now, onto another benefit of forest therapy. These cocktails that I mentioned that are incredibly useful can be cultured in batches and stored and ready to use if a person has a particular strain. So you can culture these in laboratories, whether they're genetically engineered or they're naturally cultured, and you can store them ready to be used against a common type of infection that a person may have. So you can get things ready in advance, even though you have to culture live viruses. However, as any, there are drawbacks and forest therapy is no exception. Because as I just mentioned about the notion of making things in batch, it unfortunately takes months to culture enough to have it ready for masses of patients. So large scale is quite difficult for a live virus compared to actually making a chemical drug that you can manufacture in big amounts. So that's one of the hindrances of forest therapy as a large scale use. It's more seen as a streamlined last end user type situation than a common uh, form of therapy. And that's one of the main reasons why that is very difficult to produce large scales in a short space amount of time. And the reason why that's important is you can potentially have different strains of the bacteria in question. And if you made large batches of one strain, that might not be as effective as this new mutation occurs. Just like viruses mutate, bacteria also mutate. And all of those batches that you've made may not be as effective against this bacteria as you're reculturing a new strain, so a new type of virus against this particular strain. So it's not as straightforward as just giving them a virus that you've made and it should solve the problem. It's a lot more complicated and complex than that. Now another one is actually safety and legislation. Imagine you have an entire lab floor or even building of culturing live viruses for many different strains of bacteria. That's not as straightforward as just making a generic drug. These are live viruses. Even though they only target bacteria, bacteriophage targeting bacteria, it's still a risky situation. Also there's a lot of safety standards, there's a lot of you can say red tape to make sure Everything's rightly so, everything's taken care of, and there's all safety measures in place. And that also hinders 
the amount of research, the amount of viruses you can actually make. Another one, unfortunately, is cost. It's not as simple as making a simple chemical drug in the lab, purify it and it's ready to be used, formulate it into an actual drug and you can give it to a patient. Culturing live viruses and getting it into a form that can be delivered to a patient is a lot more complicated. And to give you an idea, in the world of immunology, there's a whole new type of therapy in the last, you say, a decade, a decade or two actually, where actual researchers synthesize and create actual specific antibodies to bind to certain proteins in our body. Excuse me, that's actually causing some sort of problem. Imagine now doing that, but for actual live viruses. You know, whether you're genetically altering them for a particular strain, whether you're naturally culturing them, it's not a cheap process. And imagine you doing that on a large scale, you know, for masses of patients. That's not an easy thing to do, whether you're in the private research industry or whether it's through academia. That's not a difficult, that's not a simple thing to do. So expense, I would argue, is one of the biggest limitations that forest therapy isn't as wide stream as or mainstream as it actually could be but there's some pros and cons to that actually which i'll go through in a little bit so to summarize this part we know that forest therapy can be incredibly useful and vital in this really difficult end stage resources where antibiotics are not effective and even those most potent antibiotics are not effective specialized forest therapy so specialized viruses created to treat a particular bacteria could be really useful but as I mentioned earlier with the limitations, it's not as easy to make it wide stream and make it capable for masses of people to actually have because of its cost, its requirements, legislations, the laws. So what is the future direction for forest therapy going forward? I do think that currently we use antibiotics for a lot of types of infections and I'm one of the biggest advocates to try and minimize that. But I do know there are some benefits, especially in hospitalized situations where other things may not work. You know, we can use aspects like honey. Um, I did an episode here on the historical benefits of honey as a antibacterial usage, but we know that antibiotics do have their benefits. However, as we know, antibiotic resistance is caused by excessive uses of antibiotics. And we know that antibiotics actually damage the beneficial bacteria we have, but forest therapy can be designed to target the harmful bacteria that we have in our bodies related to that type of infection. That's where I think forest therapy can be a real benefit in terms of those end stage, the really life threatening infections that antibiotics may not be able to deal with. Normally this part of the park isn't empty. So I thought I'd make the most of it towards the end of this video. So to summarize, as I was talking, I do think that forest therapy will become more readily available. I don't think it's going to be as a mainstream approach to treat infections. But I do think as research develops, it will be easier and quicker to culture live viruses in a more efficient manner to be able to combat those life-threatening infections that antibiotics probably can't deal with. So I do think the similar structure will have about, you know, using antibiotics where, where appropriate. But I do think forest therapy will be more circulated in hospitalized treatments, in in-state treatments a lot better. Because at the moment, um, I didn't mention earlier, but at the moment, only certain Eastern countries actually established forest therapy for some uses, um, I believe Russia, um, Poland and Georgia. But Western countries are going through clinical trials at the moment, you know, um, even some are finished as of 2019. So I do think in the Western, whether UK, US, Canada, forest therapy will become a therapeutic intervention to treat, you know, antibiotic resistant um, infections, life threatening infections that could cause organ damage and amputations, as I mentioned earlier, that example. So it's a promising area, you know, it's a virus that's beneficial for us and the notion of virology and research will develop over time to the point where a person may be able to prevent themselves getting an amputation and even death in general from using a beneficial virus. So as we know, we have bad bacteria that is harmful. We also have really useful bacteria that's in our gut. Now we know that we have good viruses, not just bad viruses. Bacteria fart. Hope you enjoyed. I'm now using the wide angle lens on my phone for the first time in these videos. Hope you can see how nice and empty it is. I could just fall asleep here. But I need to go home and obviously edit this video so you guys can watch it. Hope you enjoyed today's video anyways. I hope it's something you probably haven't heard before from for majority of the population who are watching this video. So I do give you a bit of insight that there is a lot more there that we might have not known. I'm hoping to bring that to you know uh, public knowledge so we can understand that 
not all viruses are actually bad some are useful and i hope we never have to but i hope we don't have to use them because that means there's something there's some kind of infection that's quite that's quite severe so in any case um thank you for watching and hope to see you tomorrow for episode 26 we are getting very close to that episode 30 mark